Good morning. Well, I hope you have your Bible and you get you something to drink as we get ready to start this very last session out of the Old Testament uh, that we've been studying for this quarter, and this last one is on Lamentations. Now, it's a book that we don't uh, study a whole lot about because it is five funeral poems. These five funeral poems written by Jeremiah uh, after the fall of Jerusalem. So these are called laments, or that's when we get the name Lamentations that uh, Jeremiah has written. And uh, we're going to look at one of those today. This will be the third funeral poem. Uh, dirge or poem, and uh, they're pretty unique. Let me let me start off with a question for us that uh, to open us up before we even uh, begin into looking at this uh, Lamentations, and that is, uh, how does God's peace differ from other kinds of peace that we may experience? And what's the difference between God's peace and uh like a mother who has had her kids all day long and when she finally puts them to bed at night, she has peace and quiet. <laughs> That's a type of peace, is it? Or, uh, you know, from a war, peace from war. That's a different type of peace that we're talking about. What's God's peace? How does God's peace differ from other types of peace that we may experience. So uh, that's a good thing for you to think about. When the Bible talks about the peace of God, what does that mean? How does that impact? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. As I said before, Lamentations is a group of five uh, funeral poems. They're, they're called laments. That's how we get the name Lamentations. And so uh, they're also done acrostically. Now you say, what's acrostically? Acrostically means they use the Hebrew alphabet, um, the first letter being what we would call A. You know, it's not the same thing. It's Aleph in uh, Hebrew there. But the word that uh, this verse starts out begins with that letter of the alphabet. Then you look down, you know, uh, the second verse that it has would be the letter, we would say B, which there's this bath, uh, which is also B. So they, they kind of follow it, a, a, B, and of course C, and they don't have a C. There's this gimel uh, for their C, their third letter of the alphabet. But that's what they do. They go through all of the letters of the alphabet, and it begins the first word of the lament. Now, this is called acrostics. And uh, you've heard preachers do sermons uh, like an acrostic, which is uh, they'll, t they, they'll go through their A, B, C, uh, and each letter, each word begins with a different letter of the alphabet. So uh, this is what they're doing here as well. Uh, it's these five uh, funeral poems are after the fall of Jerusalem. And so uh, this is the worst time in the life and history of Jerusalem uh, that this has occurred, uh, where they've been defeated, they've been carried off into exile, uh, the temple has been destroyed, um, the people are the ones that are left over are the poorest of the land. So um, it's, it's a very, very depressing time in the history uh, of Israel. And this is why he writes these funeral uh, poems uh, that we look at. And so it's a very important time in Israel's life. It's also a very important time in Israel being able to, in the midst of this sadness, bring hope. And so uh, we're going to look at some of those things as we dive in then here and find out about this peace of God. It's very important for us to uh, find uh, God's peace in all circumstances. So let's begin at the first one. Look at chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 19. 
um, which is you know about halfway through the Hebrew alphabet there that we'll look at, uh, and it is Zalan, and it's uh, it it will begin there, and and uh, let me let me just share these verses with you, verses nineteen through twenty four here. I remember my affliction and my homelessness, the wormwood and the poison. I will continually remember them and have become depressed. Yet I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end, and they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. Fantastic. So as he begin, as he is in the midst of this funeral dirge, in this funeral poem that he's doing, he's talking about um, uh, this hope. And there we go. So your writer of your material here calls this from despair to hope. Because the despair is of the total destruction of the city and everybody's been killed or run off and taken prisoner. And it's just a terrible, depressing time uh, in, in his life. But even in the midst of this sadness and depression, do you hear what he says? Remember my affliction, God, and my homelessness. You see, everything's been destroyed in Jerusalem. And he's at that point in his life where he's despairing almost that of all the things that are going on. He's in deep despair. But listen to him. Remember. He's asking God to remember him, to remember the people. In his affliction that, you know, he's been hungry, starving. Now he's homeless uh, because the city has been defeated and, and, and all. It says, the wormwood and the poison. The wormwood was a real bitter uh, wood uh, that is used a lot of times in, in poetry and everything to, to describe how you're feeling. So there was this bitterness and poison. He says, it's just, my life is terrible. It really is. But God, I want you to remember me even where I am right now. In the midst of this bitterness and, and this deadly poison I feel like my life is in, remember me. And listen how he does it. He makes a promise to God. I will continually remember them and have become depressed. He remembers all these things. Yet I call this to mind. It, it's almost like he puts the brakes on on the on his despair on his feelings, and yet he and he goes. Yet I call this to mind. What's he going to bring to mind? Is it still everything about this going on that's so depressing? Mm -mm. He says, "I bring all this to mind. Therefore, I have hope. The hope is that God is going to be with him in this. That God's peace is going to overtake him in his." sadness and his desolation that he's experiencing and he says listen to this in the very worst of times this is what jeremiah says because of the lord's faithful love this is the thing we have to remember when things are going terrible in our lives we need to remember god's faithful love his love for us he says because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. Those of us who are still alive, no matter what we're going through, as he tells his people, we do not perish. It may be terrible circumstances right now. It may be, you know, all the banks have, have closed and there is no food and I'm homeless. There's no house to live in. At least I'm alive. I'm still alive. Now, one of the things that bring this to mind is I know that you've seen on the news lately about Lahana, Hawaii, 
where the wildfire spread across that nation's island. Uh, or that states, I say nation, it's an island nation, you might say Hawaii is, but it's part of our 50 states. <laughs> but um, it was a beautiful city, beautiful island, and this wildfire swept across. In fact, it happened so fast that many people were only able to jump into the ocean to protect themselves. And we know now that, you know, over 100 people have perished because of this fire. And yet, even though people lost everything and the fire swept through, you heard some of the testimonies that I am still alive. My family members are still alive. That becomes a very important point. And what Jeremiah is making here about that is that God is with him while he's still alive, even though the circumstances are terrible, devastating, just like for the people in, in, in uh, Maui, Hawaii there um, with Lahana, all of that destruction where fire swept through and, and destroyed. He said that town was from like 1911. Um you know, uh, uh, those some of those buildings were, and they had generation after generation of generation of pictures and and memorabilia from from the past. That's it's gone. So those people are devastated. I, I can see how they would relate to Jeremiah being homeless and total destruction of all that was around them. Jeremiah can say. Because of your faithful love, we do not perish. For your mercies never end. You were merciful. I'm still alive. Listen to how he says that. Your mercies are new every morning. Isn't that a great way to think? But this becomes a great song in, in some of our uh, hymnology um, that your mercies never end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God has been faithful, had he? You know, Sandra and I, have. we started our life so young. I was 19, she was 18. And uh, we began to have children and uh, college, trying to work on our degrees and all of this stuff and we were moving around. I worked for the Corps Engineers uh, co-op student, and we moved around just every few months uh, in between semesters. Um, it was hard. It was tough. But we had each other, and uh, we experienced a great loss during that time when we lost our, our Sandra was pregnant with our second child. And... Uh, she lost the baby in the eighth month. And it was uh, a terrible time. Thank goodness we had family, we had friends, we had a church over in Murfreesboro, Arkansas that jumped in and took care of our, our son while we were at the hospital. Um, you know, family came and ministered to Sandra and uh, took her and Jarrett back to uh, Natchez and took care of them. Uh, for a little bit while she recovered from that. Uh, so, you know, during that time, we had a doctor who said to us in a very loving way that God said to that child, why don't you just stay with me? And uh, it comforted us to know that that child was taken care of by God for Great is his faithfulness to us. His mercies are new every day. And I hope that you will find that peace of God, too, that you, no matter what circumstances you get into, either your health or your finances or, or uh, just the struggles of life where you feel depressed, um, that you would allow God uh, to show his mercy on you give you his peace. And you experience that by experiencing God's relationship with you and recognizing great is God's faithfulness and his mercy. They're new every 
point. Well, let's see what the second part is here that we need to focus on. There's a question that your writer poses that you can ask your small group right there to discuss this. And it is, how does uh, focusing on God's love and mercy help a person endure God's discipline? Now, this is where Jeremiah is. is remember, his nation is being disciplined because of the broken covenant. The people broke the covenant. They were worshiping other idols. They were mistreating uh, widows and orphans and the aliens in their land. And because of that, God's judgment came on them. God's discipline came on the nation. And the nation was destroyed by Babylon. You remember that? Well, the writer here wants us to think about this question. How does focusing on God's love help somebody endure God's discipline? That is, we know that we've broken God's word or we've disobeyed his commandments. And some of the things that happen in our life are from God's discipline. That is, he disciplines us to turn us back to him, to begin obeying his word. Now, no one likes to have discipline. You remember growing up? And when your dad started reaching for that belt and it came off his waist and went, whoosh, 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 folded it, you knew it was a bad time. <laughs> but most of the time, you knew it was coming if you had done something that your mother or father said not to do. And this was discipline. I remember my dad once said to me, this is going to hurt me more than you. And I said, are you going to whip yourself? <laughs> because as a child, I go, there is no way this is hurting you more than it's going to hurt me. I'm the one receiving that belt. But you know, you, when you became a parent and had to discipline your own kids, you know how hard it was at times when they stepped across the line of one of the rules that you had for your house and you had to punish that child in order to get their attention so they won't keep doing that. It does hurt you as a parent, doesn't it? Because we we want to just be able to love our kids without having to do a spanking or putting them in the corner or uh, taking away something that they treasured in order uh, to get their attention about breaking a rule. Well, this is what God does to us as well. And so this question, how does focusing on God's love and mercy help a person endure God's discipline? Well, one I knew that belt was coming when I did something wrong. We need to understand that when we break God's covenant, when we do something wrong that is against his will for us, we face his discipline and we know it's coming. But you know what? We know he's doing it out of love and mercy. And that helps us get through that discipline. It really does. Well, let's look at, the second section here, verses 25 through 30, and that is from waiting to seeing. From waiting to seeing. Let's see how that does. Look at verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. Patience. To the person who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation from the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is still young. Let him sit alone and be silent, for God has disciplined him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. Perhaps there is still hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him and let him be filled with disgrace. From waiting to seeing, what does this mean? Well, waiting is that patience that sometimes God's discipline is going to take time. 
about you, but sometimes we get very, very impatient. I know it bothers you when somebody flies past you and then gets in front of you and hits their brakes to turn off the road. And it gets you mad, doesn't it? Or what about when you get to Walmart and you look at the checkout line and it's four deep and you look over at the self-checkout and it's four or five deep. Now, then you make a decision, do I want to wait or should I just leave the buggy here and go home? Well, you know that what you put in that buggy you need. And some people complain to themselves or even out loud if they have to wait in line. Or at the bank, at the teller's thing where, you know, you only have one person back there now. And then you have to wait to get your service at the bank. Yes, it sometimes tries your patience, doesn't it? But your writer here, Jeremiah, in this poem that he's doing, is trying to remind us that waiting is one of the things God wants from us, and he wants that to grow, our patience. You see, patience is one of the virtues that belong to God. And sometimes he wants us to learn that, that we have to be patient on God because he is patient on us. Listen to that, how it goes again. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. I don't know about you, but I always saw my kids get very upset when I would say, I'm running into this store for just a minute. <laughs> I'd run in. it take more than a minute, didn't it? It always takes more than a minute. And they would sometimes be in the car counting. It's been 300 seconds. That's way over a minute. <laughs> I had to... Because they said, Dad, you lied. You lied to me when you said it'd be just a minute. So I had to be careful. I had to quit saying just a minute. I have to say, I'll be a few minutes. That way there's not a certain time limit. Right. God is the good to those who wait for him. Right. Do we get tired of God taking action in our lives? You know, when we won't... God to be vengeful and, and, and God to jump into action. And God says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. Well, we have to wait for God to find his goodness, don't we? It's good to wait quietly. That's another thing. We'd rather wait and complain, right? <laughs> Here, Jeremiah is saying, look, no, just wait quietly. Wait for God to act. God will act, but you have to wait for him at certain times. To do that, he says, it is good to wait quietly for salvation from God. God will show up and save you, rescue you. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he's still young, which means the yoke, this is a great picture. You know, the yoke was used to help train. They would put an older ox next to a younger ox and they put the yoke on with the, the wooden uh, bar across. That way, the old one would teach the young one how to be patient how to follow the commands of the steerer there, whether the, to move forward, to stop, uh, to go left or go right. Well, younger ox being young and full of energy would kind of move around and all like that while the old ox that had learned the discipline of waiting at yoke, since they were yoked together, the young one couldn't get away couldn't do his own thing. 
And this is set up with us, this picture of being yoked. See, it is good for a man to bear the yoke. That means to be trained while you're still young. As you look back on your life, yep, all my white hair, gray hair, you know, I've learned a lot of things. I've learned to be more patient. I remember when I was young, yep, do it fast, get it quick, get it done. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes that hurry caused mistakes. And I wound up having to redo some jobs because I didn't take my time. I didn't check my measurements or wasn't patient with some people, especially my children. Remember that? It's amazing how much more patient we are with our grandkids than we were with our kids. You know why that is, don't you? We've learned to be patient. God has placed his yoke on us so that we are more like him. Now, there are times we're not patient. There are times that we are inconsiderate. Yes, you know why? We are sinners. And we mess up. But God is still having us in training. God still has us yoked up with him. And we need to face the discipline and wait on God. And here Jeremiah sees that in the destruction of his country, and he knows that God is going to be there to rescue them. It's going to take 70 years for the rescue to take place, for them to come from captivity all the way back. But Jeremiah is certain that God will fulfill his love for his people. He's patient for them. So it says then, let him sit alone and be silent. That's what Jeremiah's going to have to do because, you know, he's there. For God has disciplined him and let him put his mouth in the dust, which just shows that idea of uh, bowing down before God, getting dirt in your mouth because you're face down. You are realizing that sackcloth and ashes type of approach of humbling yourself before God is this illustration that you and I need to humble ourselves before God when he is disciplining in us. Perhaps there is still hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him. And we see that in the New Testament where Jesus tells us, if someone strikes you, you should turn the other cheek. Look where that came from. Is this Old Testament passage from a funeral poetry song? Hmm. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him. And let him be filled with disgrace. It's, hey, you've messed up. You, were you disgraced when you got a whipping from your parents? Well, of course. You got caught. Um, did your parents, I don't know, but if yours did like mine did, I, I, my dad would say, would you? I'm so mad at you right now, I'm not going to whip you. But go to your room and think about what you've done. <laughs> well, that was probably worse than just getting the whipping right at the moment. What? <laughs> Where you had to go to your room and what did dad mean by think about what I've done? I got caught. You're not really upset except that you got caught and you go, yeah. And then you start thinking about, I really shouldn't have done it. I was told not to do it, and I did it anyway. So I deserve the spanking I'm fixed to get. And it just added to the tension to the pain. Or I saw that sometimes people put on extra pair of underwear right before they got hit. <laughs> oh, God's discipline, our parents' discipline, they're very, very much similar. It's because we've done something against the rules. Here, God is trying to teach Jeremiah the same thing about that, from waiting to see. Let me ask you this question. How does waiting for God look like, and why is it so hard? How does waiting for the Lord, what does that look like, and why is it so hard? 
<laughs> Good question for you, Bruce. You got another one. Why, why is it so important for believers to wait on God and learn as they do so? What do you mean, wait on God and learn as we do so? Did you know God is trying to teach you something every day? He's trying to teach you about his character. He's trying to teach you how he wants your character to reflect his character. He's trying to get you to look more like him. Why? You're his child. And, you know, you should be able to look in the mirror, just like with your parents, and see some characteristics that they had whether it be, you know, their hair color or their height or facial expressions. Or in my case, my son has my laugh. Everybody laughs and says, he laughs like you, Aubrey. Well, couldn't help it. He listened to it for 18 years before he left home. <laughs> no. Wait on God and pray that you learn what he's trying to teach you. That's what Jeremiah is saying. All right, well, let's look at this last section. From rejection to compassion. You know, where, where God rejected his people, now there's compassion. Jeremiah brings this up. Verses 31 and 32 here. I meant through 33. It says, For the Lord will not reject us forever. Even if he causes suffering, he will show compassion according to the abundance of his faithful love. For he does not enjoy bringing affliction or suffering to mankind. On mankind. Like a parent, do, a true loving parent does not enjoy punishment to his kids. He does not having to inflict pain or disappointment on them based on the discipline that must be done. God is teaching us that as well. For the people, he's trying to give hope. God's not going to reject us forever. In fact, he's already made a promise uh, through Jeremiah and, and that we see that it's going to be 70 years. It's going to be 70 years in Isaiah and Jeremiah that they are going to be in exile. And now, Jeremiah is admitting God will not reject us forever. It's going to be a long time. It's going to feel like but God does love us, that this discipline is our own fault. Even if he calls suffering, he will show compassion. You remember David when he was given the choice? There was three things that could happen after David numbered the troops there toward the end of 2 Samuel. And the punishment, uh, he was given three choices. You know, uh, one was a year on the run. Another one was uh, running from his enemies. Another was uh, uh, some type of, of men running after him or a uh, plague on the people. And so, therefore, he chose the plague on, on the whole nation because he says, I'd rather fall into the hands of my God. Why? Because God is merciful and compassion. And so what happened was the, the uh, death angel was moving through all the people um, with this plague that was going on. And, and David prayed and God stopped the plague and told him that he needed to go sacrifice at this location. And he did. He went and bought the land and the ox and the uh, wood and everything and made his sacrifice there, which many commentators think will, will be the point, the foundation of the temple there uh, on Mount Zion, and that this is where he sacrificed to God uh, uh, this offering to stop the plague. And it stops here because God stops it, sees David's heart, and has compassion on the people. And that's what David hoped that God would do, that he would rather fall in the hands of God, who's 
who's compassionate and merciful, than fall into the hands of his enemies uh, because they're not merciful and they don't care and they will carry out their punishment while God may relent. And this is Jeremiah's plea here as well. Even if he calls suffering, he will show compassion according to the abundance of his faithful love. Why? He does not enjoy bringing affliction or suffering for mankind. And that's important for us to know. This is not something God enjoys doing. In fact, when it occurs, a lot of times it's for discipline and it's to turn people toward God so that he can show his mercy and his love for God's good. Isn't that a great way to end this study uh, as we've looked back over Jeremiah, Lamentations, yes, God's judgment, but yet this hope, this hope of God's peace. What is it? Even in the midst of suffering, we can trust God. Love and his mercy. Hope you have a great week and that you would also use those characteristics on your family, your friends, your co-workers, Extend God's grace of faithfulness and love and show mercy to those around you. Help you build your patience that God's trying to help you through. Now, if you are facing some type of discipline from God, please turn to God. Admit your mistakes. Admit you crossed the line. Admit you broke his promise. And he will save you from your affliction. He gives that promise here in Jeremiah. And so if that's the point you find yourself in, please repent. Get with a close friend and, and ask them to pray with you as you go through God's discipline and wait on him to bring you to the other side. Well, thank you for tuning in today. We look forward to Mark beginning uh, next week as we study a new section as we go to the New Testament. Let me pray for you. Father, be with those listening today. I pray you help them, help the teachers that are watching this to prepare for their class, uh, that they too will continue to uh, read your word, to allow you to be faithful in their lives uh, and to encourage their people in their classroom as they talk about these things, about how you're working in their life. And thank you for that, Lord, in that gracious name. Amen. Well, continue to work with your classmates. Teachers, a couple of questions you can end up with to close your classes. How is discipline a function of love? Go back to that parenting model. And can one have love without discipline? That's a big discussion. Can you have love? without discipline. Use those to get your classes to generate in a closing. What actions can we take this week so that we can love even when we're disciplined and we can receive God's love with that as well? So this is a function of our hope, of our love that God's trying to teach us. Have a great week. God bless you.